our spe second speaker is um, um, Dr. Stefan Schmitz Falkenberg, um, who is incidentally, incidentally also moved uh, to the Moran Eye Center from Bonn in Germany. Um, while in Bonn, he was assistant medical director of the Department of Ophthalmology, uh, where he specializes and still specializes in clinical and surgical treatment of macular and retinal diseases. Uh, he also co-founded and directed uh, the Reading Center there, um, which so and the Bone Reading Center was one of the major, if not the major, reading center in, uh, in Europe. Uh, he's an ex expert in retinal imaging, and uh, as director of the uh, reading center, he's, uh, he's developed and implemented many standard methods for people to grade images. Uh, he really is at the forefront of AMD research, and um, he's widely recognized as a ma major player in, in the field. Um, he currently holds the uh, John A. Um, Huntsman, John, sorry, John Huntsman's chair, and uh, he moved to Utah to lead uh, you read, which is, uh, will be the Moran Zone Reading Center. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Musa. Good morning, Moran, dear Randy, <laughs> dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen. Before I continue with the topic AMD Revisited, I would like to take the opportunity to thank all of you for the very warm welcome here in the United <laughs> States, in Utah and Salt Lake City, and particularly in the Moran. Monica, the two boys, and myself, we are really enjoying our new life right now. It's a wonderful experience. And saying this, I also have to mention that the second half of last year was quite tough for us. We were separated. And um, these are some impressions of our two boys separated <laughs> from their mother, just with their father, and he's trying to get them used to the US American culture. <laughs> so in October, I brought them over to to uh, Salt Lake City in the custody of her mother. Um, I think that a great time. My time was not so good. I was pretty alone for almost three months in Germany. And these are some impressions from my farewell dinners with my team, with my postgraduates in Bonn and the team of the Reading Center. Saying this, today it's a great pleasure for Monica and myself to be here at Grand Rounds and present. And actually, we had a great discussion at home. What should we present? And there were lots of topics on the table. And one of them, this which was abandoned very fast, was that I should maybe represent some surgical cases from my collection. And um, preparing for this talk, I thought I should show at least one surgical video. And this is this, is this vitrectomy of a giant retinal tear, which went quite good. And at the end, when I looked at, into the eye, and I have to say, I didn't, I didn't do this by purpose, and um, this was just as nature gave me the case. I saw this laser uh, at the edge of the tour, and it was actually the first letter of the first name of my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so these are my disclosures. And when we talk about AMD, I think we have to mention Drusen, because Drusen are the hallmark of the disease, because Drusen, they lead to atrophy, and atrophy is the cause of visual loss in these patients, the most common cause. And today, with multimodal retinal imaging, we can better monitor the evolution of the disease from drusen to atrophy. Terms like nascent geographic atrophy have been introduced. Different patterns leading to atrophy have been described. So multimodal retinal imaging, and this applies, of course, not only to AMD, allows us for the non-invasive mapping of disease evolution at higher resolution. And in the last two or three years, we have learned with artificial intelligence that actually multimodal retinal imaging is a perfect playground for AI. However, at the end of the day, the most important question that remains is actually what is the impact on function for all these morphological changes? Because this is essential for the affected individuals, the patients, and also, and this should be not forgotten, of importance for regulatory bodies, caregivers, and payers, particularly when we are trying to introduce a new therapeutic intervention. And in this context, I would like to introduce today the term inferred sensitivity, which is the AI-based estimate of local retinal sensitivity from retinal structure as detected by multimodal retinal imaging. Inferred sensitivity has been already applied in a few conditions, including AMD, 
And it has been also suggested that inferred sensitivity may serve as a quasi-functional outcome in clinical trials. And then before I will talk more about the prediction of retinal function based on morphology, I would like to share with you a clinical case. So this is a 51-year-old female, relatively young, diagnosed with AMD. And please imagine this is a typical patient seen by other doctors came, came, coming to the university setting for a second opinion, and the patient is really eager to get involved into a clinical study. She reports of slow deterioration of both eyes, more on right and the left, and the general and family history is basically unremarkable. In colors, we see substantial pigmentary changes, vitelliform material, hypopigmentation, as well as large and small drusen, including particular drusen. These later changes come much more prominent with fluorescent angiography, where we see the typical stars in the sky pattern. Of course, we also, we are in the era of OCT, so we are, of course we're also doing OCT, and there's one particular finding which catches our attention, and this is this cleft, the subretinal pocket there. So what are you going, going to do with this? Anybody? I don't see any hands, so of course we didn't do this because I showed you the fluorescing, there's no leakage. But this is actually very, very sound. So should we treat this? And what is the prognosis? Of course, there's a fear that this may collapse, um, but the question is when? Will it take months or even years? Will we see atrophy? And thus, I was coming back to my first question, will the patient lose vision? So we observed this patient. This is the picture one year later. And you see there's still subretinal fluid. And the time course goes on. Actually, it goes over seven years. And indeed, at year five, you see the collapse. But this looks pretty normal to me. This is the whole series again. You see the pigmented epithelium detachment, collapse, and almost normal retina. At high resolution, we can actually appreciate that at the, at the time of the collapse, the outer retina looks pretty intact. The external limiting membrane is contiguous, and there are only subtle iterations below at the outer retinal band. What was vision at this point? How, how well did the patient see at this point? You're, this is my next slide. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> the title of my talk is Drews and Function. So right. I have talked about Drews. <laughs> all, right, all right, all right, all right. I stand correct. <laughs> but this is for the people, not for us, the people who don't believe us. This is a dense OCT scan showing you again that there is indeed a collapse and the exact retina. So what about visual function? So the <laughs> Randy's question. Um, this is best corrected visual acuity, and it's actually getting better. <coughs> you know there's some noise in this assessment in routine clinics. So I show you now the visual acuity as assessed in our clinical trials unit, which was a natural history study. And there's not so much noise, because also reflecting, if you do this EDTRS assessment, it's much more accurate. We also did low luminance visual acuity. I'm not sure if everybody is aware of it has become recently more and more popular because it picks up changes in AMD patients which have typically troubles with low light conditions, contrast sensitivity. We started this um, in the last two years. But in this case, it doesn't uh, give you a, a, a much a signal. Basically, I have to say low, visual, uh, low luminance visual acuity assessment is based on BCVA assessment. The only difference is that you put a neutral density filter in front of the eye of the patient. But we also look deeper into this, and now we are coming to fundus-controlled perimetry, or also called microperimetry, which allows us to project stimuli at certain retinal locations in real time to assess retinal sensitivity. So this is one year after collapse, second year, and third year, done with a NIDIC MP1 device. And um, to, to in a very high level, um, if you have green colors, this is good retinal function. If it's red, it's bad, it's loss of function, and yellowish is somewhere in between. And actually, again, it's getting more greenish, so it's actually getting better over time. Probably also reflecting learning effects of this, um, of this test. Um, when we look closer to this, and um, this is now getting a little bit more into detail, I highlighted here the points at the side of the lesion, which were by random at this very location of the PED, and the red colors are showing you the points which show a loss, compared to normals, of over five decibels. 
And if we compare this to the overall sensitivity for all 56 test points, there's no difference. So on a rough estimate, there's no difference between this very specific lesion on the retina and the overall sensitivity of these eyes. We also did scotopic testing. And here, there's a larger difference. The area involved has more points which are reduction, severe reduction as compared to the overall sensitivity assessment of these eyes. So showing us that there might be a signal in scotopic sensitivity, might, might be more accurate to assess functional deficits in these kind of patients. Saying this, um, I would like to talk more about fundus controlled perimetry. And I have to say, as retinal specialist in, in the community, this has a very bad reputation. We are not used like the glaucoma specialists to do visual field testing. It's complicated. And we are spoiled by multimodal retinal imaging. It's so easy. It's so fast. And it's so accurate. In fact, the our fast resolution of fundus controlled perimetry is about two orders lower as multimodal retinal imaging. It takes more time. It's not seconds, it's minutes. And also, it's a subjective test. So patient cooperation is highly relevant. We have to take into account patient-specific factors like test time, wrong pressure events, and other behavioral factors. And there's a, basically, there's a trade-off between test time, spatial resolution, so the number of stimuli you can project in a patient during one session, <coughs> and the point-wise test accuracy, like the Chesler strategy. So again, I'm not sure if there are any glaucoma specialists here, but this is a very, this is the file you can go with retina specialists on this topic. <coughs> so this is a case of geographic atrophy. Let's have a look again. Um, this is a typical multimodal imaging, even OCT, uh, high resolution OCT. And now let's have a look from the patient perspective, because we're talking about function today. So we have to turn around the lesion, because the patient sees upside down, so to speak. And if you look at the chart, this is a typical finding, I'm sure you've seen it before, you have the forward sparing, and patients can pick up single letters on the chart while they're at the same time reporting of difficulties while reading. So if we apply retinal um, fundus control perimetry in this eye, and this is a typical standardized grid, um, these points are not really picking up the problem, the lesion. Yeah? The individual distribution of atrophic spots is not recognized. But the result is that we have a limited and variable number of test stimuli in relation to atrophic areas. And particularly, the assessment of functional changes over time is challenging. So to overcome these limitations, we have introduced what we call patient-tailored perimetry grids in geographic atrophy. So basically, we're taking the imaging data, and then we are generating individualized grids. So we design isoholes around the atrophic lesions, like an onion-shaped pattern. And in order to maximize the number of test points in disease-relevant regions, so in the junction zone of atrophy, this is shown here the GA, and then you have its predefined distances to the border. Tests to be placed up to about 800 microns away. And at the same time, we have an overall, the overall number of test points is limited. And this is showing you some data. So this is done with a MILA device. It's a different device than the NIDAC device. It has three different types of test testing. So mesopic testing under room light conditions and two dark adaptive tests, sine and rat. This allows us to better discriminate rot from cone function. So dark adaptive sine testing particularly shows us um, rot function. And um, this is a GA border, and we're going more toward the periphery in all three types of testing. And as you can see, the sensitivity is, in this test, the lowest. So indicating that, um, that, there is, that rot function is, exceeds cone dysfunction. Yeah? Uh, point number one, I was a little bit too fast, shows you that both, all these three curves are going up. So there's an increased sensitivity away from the GA border. And even this is only cross-sectional, um, this also suggests, because the curve is much flatter for dark adaptive sign testing, that rod dysfunction precedes cone dysfunction in this disease. So now we're taking this data and applying inferred sensitivity. So we would like to investigate the AI-based prediction of retinal sensitivity based on retinal microstructure. In particular, we would like to examine the importance of various imaging features and also the potential influence of behavioral factors, factors, as well as looking more into this potential differences between rot and cone function. So this is data I presented at the Macular Society. This is a study where 
we looked at 41 GA eyes um, with a mean area of um, six square millimeters. So multimodal retinal imaging was carried out in addition to fundus controlled perimetry with patient telequets using this Maya device involving mesopic testing, dark adaptation, and both dark adaptive red and scientist testing. So lots of a battery of tests to get a good, good overview of morphology and function in these patients. We also included data of 40 healthy eyes for standardization to patient data. This shows you um, an overview high level of the analysis strategy. So with all this data acquired, first we generated thickness and intensity maps of different retinal layers and imaging modalities. So for OCT, for each slab, um, thickness and intensity maps were, um, yeah, were generated. Then this data was registered to FCP results. So the Goldman three circle area, for each circle area we have morphology data. And this was used to uh, employ patient-wise one, one out cross validation with random forest prediction models in order to assess the absolute error for prediction accuracy of retinal function. So in other words, we generated functional maps of the retina and then could compare at each location, the predicted function to the actual, actually psychophysically measured values. And this slide shows you now the prediction accuracy in different scenarios for, again, for the three types of testing, mesopic, dark adaptive sign, dark adaptive red testing. Um, this is a mean absolute error, and we looked at six different scenarios for each of the three types of um, testing. And uh, we'll go into details in the next slide, but you see that the accuracy varies between roughly five decibel to about 2.6 decibel. So going into more details, and this is only shown for metopic testing, we looked at different scenarios, as I said. So in scenario 1A, we have an unknown patient, so we haven't done any uh, fundus control perimetry in this patient. And then we apply our model based only on imaging features. So there are 26 markers, like thickness of the ONL, reflectivity of the um, outer plexiform layer, et cetera. And if you apply the model, we can predict the function with a mean error of 4.6 decibel. If you include in the model B and C behavioral factors, like from pressure events or even fixation, there's basically no, no further improvement in scenario one. In scenario two, we um, assume that we have done a short fundus controlled exam, 50% of test points to be precise. And then we can improve our uh, error to 3.1 decibel and even can further improve it with behavioral factors to about 2.9 decibel. So in other words, at a certain retinal location, you can predict retinal function in this disease with a mean error of 2.9 decibel in the best model. And this is actually a substantial difference compared to the first model. So what is the most important feature for prediction? The most important morphological feature, and this is the outer nuclear layer thickness. This applies for all three types of testing. And I think, or I believe actually, this is highly biologically plausible as well because these are the photoreceptors. Fallout second and third are full retinal thickness and either the inner retinal thickness or the RPEDC thickness. Going a little bit more on the data, this is more complicated. If you look at the structure function correlation of the outer nuclear layer, so the most important predictor of morphology, again, for all three types of testing, this is normal ONL thickness. And if it, the thickness is increased, the curve is flat. So an increased ONL has similar sensitivity as compared to a normal ONL. If the ONL gets reduced, all curves go up. So this function goes down. And the steepest curve is seen for the dark adaptive sign testing, suggesting that the strongest degree of functional loss is seen for <coughs> rod function again. Fitting in this model on this current understanding that we have earlier and more pronounced rod versus cone function in the disease. So this is the case to, to better illustrate you this model. So this is a typical color fundus photograph of a GA lesion. Um, and here below we see the um, sensitivity map, so the, the, by the generated maps of function as um, calculated by the model. And there's reddish and bluish color at the location of the large patch of atrophy. So the model picks up that there is dysfunction. And the model can even do more. There are two rot red or two blue spots above here. And these are tiny spots of atrophy. You can hardly see them on the colors. 
we actually need the OCT to see this choroidal hypertransmission and the loss of the outer nuclear layer. So the model can also pick up the functional loss of these two small foci. And furthermore, there's a rough free area in the very fovea, which also is, of course, biological plausible. So inferred sensitivity, and this is now looking broad now on, on, on the topic, can, can be used potentially in the future at the quasi-functional surrogate endpoint in future clinical trials. And I think a meaningful application would be that we have test data sets, so a small amount of patients where we did, as we did in this study, extensive psychophysical testing and volumetric multimodal retinal imaging. Then we apply AI, um, AI to <coughs> and apply this data, these models, to larger cohorts. This will allow us to predict retinal dysfunction based on non-invasive retinal imaging, while the FCP testing would only include a limited number of test stimuli or is even completely uh, waived. So in conclusions, retinal sensitivity may be inferred from structural retinal imaging using AI algorithms such as random forest regression in patients with geographic atrophy um, secondary to AMD. It may be also applied to other diseases, but of course we think that this is all disease specific. In contrast to burdensome FCP, this approach provides sensitivity maps which surface the limits of psychophysical testing in terms of the area covered and the spatial resolution. And finally, inferred sensitivity may serve as a crazy functional surrogate outcome in clinical trials, especially in the consideration of retinal regions beyond areas of geographic atrophy. And I would like to close with a final case to close this um, morning session today. This is again a patient with geographic atrophy, and Monica has shown this patient bef before, and this is not just pure geographic atrophy. There is this little area here which is in quiescence, CNV lesion and the phobia. So this is the part you really would like to rescue in your patient. And if you now apply microperimetry, you can actually see that retinal function is just preserved in this area where we have the QCNV location. Thank you very much for your attention. So, uh, <clears throat> Stefan, again, have you looked at, the, at, at some of these differences? I'm, that's part of the beauty of obviously being here because we have so many that are genotype between, you know, homozygous risk at one and homozygous risk at ten. D d d is that starting to correlate with, with, with some of these other differences that you're seeing yet, or is it just too soon? We're just beginning to dig into that data. Um, I think uh, it's, it's, we are at the very beginning. This is not the end. This is maybe the beginning of the, begin the, the end of the beginning. Um, I think in the chromosome um, uh, one cases you see more drusen, and it's probably more likely that you have this QC and V cases in, in this group. Um, in terms of function, maybe the, the markers are different. So in the chromosome 10 uh, patient, patients, I think we see more outer retinal thinning, more severe outer retinal thinning. Um, so and, and, and we've certainly seen homozygous tens that have no obvious drusen at all and have got a geographic atrophy. But they, have, but they have severe choroidal thinning and they have severe outer uh, nuclear layer thinning and they're actually struggling. If you ask them, they are struggling with uh, vision in low light uh, yes. conditions. So particularly here being in Utah, I'm impressed about all these stars at night. <laughs> um, I'm sure if I, if I will ask, if I, if I ask patients, they will, may say the first time I noticed I have a problem was that I couldn't see the stars anymore. Right. Fascinating. So have you approached the regulatory authorities either in Europe or in the U.S. with this idea so far with quasi-functional quasi yet or not? Or do you think they'll be receptive to it or not for approval of drugs or anything? I think there, there, there will be. Monica can maybe uh, say a little bit more about it. Um, I have been in discussion, not with regulatory authorities, but, but uh, several pharmaceutical companies, and they're very interested in this. And again, the, the biggest struggle at the moment is to transfer this application from a unicenter setting to a multicenter trial. And this has been, I think this is the next step, that we perform a multicenter trial to demonstrate that this method can really be um, applied. So I'm sure, Monica, if you would like to, to add yeah, something. Yeah, so Paul, this is, an, uh, of course, one of the main questions. So um, we are actually at the beginning uh, with 
bringing microperimetry or fundus control perimetry um, as an accepted primary functional outcome measure into uh, trials in AMD. And um, actually, we, we got a signal uh, by the FDA that um, if we show some more data, this could be accepted as a functional endpoint. So we saw central visual <coughs> acuity does not work, not in geographic entropy, it does not work in uh, early or intermediate AMD because the lesions are not always in the very center, in the fovea, and so visual acuity, best corrected central visual acuity will not guide us or will not help to prove a therapeutic effect because it does not pick up the disease progression. This is why actually we, but also other people worldwide, are working now um, on um, bringing microperimetry forward that this gets accepted by the FDA as a functional outcome measure. But as Stefan mentioned, mentioned um, microperimetry does not have the best um, reputation right now because by using other devices, there was an extremely high variability. Uh, the test did not take into account the lesion area, the lesion size, and so all the results were not really, um, were not uh, really comprehensive. And this is why we worked and we are working now on patient-tailored grids, on lesion-tailored grids, and um, we uh, generate data on reproducibility, retest data, and so we really hope that uh, this will help an FDA accept this as a functional outcome measure. Okay. Well, thank you very much and have a great have a great day.